Department of Germanic and Slavic Studies on uh, uh, representations of disability in German literature and culture. And uh, um, we have a small speaker series in conjunction with that, just because we have experts and campus and further afield uh, that engage with this, uh, with this um, topic. Our first speaker was Helena Haag, who spoke about critical disability theory and lived experience. Uh, today, it's Professor Jay Dolmage, a specialist in uh, uh, critical theory, uh, critical disability theory. The next uh, speaker will be uh, Dr. Alec Kittel from Texas Tech, who will uh, lead us through an analysis of a particular German text. So, and the last one, the last one on March 31st is an Austrian author who has written a text that, uh, uh, that prominently features a um, uh, uh, physically impaired uh, protagonist and uh, will then get into a question answering why and how a, uh, um, a creative artist is uh, representing this particular topic. Uh, the reason why we're doing it, and uh, this is also why we can have this, uh, this series, is uh, that disability studies uh, really reflects on minority identities and particularly a minority identity that is not often central to our thinking, to our, our understanding of the world. We are very, very aware of racial inequities, um, gender inequities and so forth, but this particular topic is, uh, is not that often talked about. So we thought we'd bring it uh, to the fore, and I'd like to thank the the Center uh, Waterloo Center for German Studies for financially supporting uh, the the speaker series. Um, before we move on to the introduction of Dr. Dolmarsh, I just wanted to uh, um, to acknowledge uh, where we live and where we work. Uh, we are situated on the traditional territory of the neutral Ashinabeg and Haudenosaunee people. Uh, the University of Waterloo, you may know, was built on the Haldeman track, which is land granted in 1784 to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River from its source in Dundalk to its mouth at Lake Erie. That land was granted to support the Six Nations in perpetuity, but as we all know, this does not happen. Our work at reconciliation with indigenous peoples includes decolonizing our historical narratives, our minds and our hearts. And I am very, very glad that the University of Waterloo is currently taking major steps towards this goal. This is an ongoing process and we have a long way to go, but at least we have started it. So now I'd like to take uh, to hand over the mic to uh, some of the seminar participants who would like to introduce Dr. Dolmash. Yes, hello and welcome from me as well. Today it is my and my fellow students Angelina and Anne-Marie's pleasure to introduce Jay Dolmage today. He is a professor of English and the associate chair of the Undergraduate Communication Outcome Initiative at the University of Waterloo. Furthermore, he's also the founding editor of the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies, which publishes peer-reviewed articles that advance research in multidisciplinary international field of disability studies. He did his Bachelor of Arts in British Columbia, his Master in Windsor, Ontario, and his PhD in Miami uh, at the University of Ohio. And his work brings together rhetoric, writing, and disability studies, asking questions like, how do we talk about disability and how do people with disabilities shape the discourse of disability? Besides teaching and being a researcher, Dr. Dolmich is also working on an ongoing basis to develop teaching materials, resources, and ideas that would make the classrooms more accessible for all students. Among his numerous publications, his first book titled Disability Rhetoric was published in 2014. It looks at rhetorical theory and history through the lens of disability studies. In the book, rhetoric is not seen as political, but rather as the study of the ways in which power circulates through discourse. It is argued that communication has always been obsessed with the meaning of the body and that bodily difference is always highly rhetorical that all communication is embodied and that the body plays a central role in all expression. One of the main arguments is that greater attention to a range of bodies is essential to a better understanding of rhetorical histories, 
theories, and possibilities. Those of us who are taking Michael's seminar have read a chapter regarding disability myths from this book as a preparation for the upcoming lecture, which we are all very much looking forward to. I would like to thank Professor Dolmich for coming and sharing his knowledge and research with us today. And with that being said, I hand over to Professor Dolmich. Thank you so much. So I want, I want to point out a couple of things. Um, the first is that my notes for my, for that my speaking notes are posted in the chat. So if you want to access those for accessibility or to check some of the references or to be able to come back to later, you can please go ahead and do that. And then the second part is that, uh, and I'm really glad that, that, that many of the folks here have read the chapter on disability myths and rhetorics. And um, I guess just the chapter on disability myths, but that's okay. Um, the, the, because that's, I created a handout and it's a little bit like a worksheet, okay? So I've got three kids at home today um, because of the snow day and they often get uh, a worksheets on a day like today that then they have to work on. So that's what I'm giving all of you. Um, I'm hoping that it's, that it's kind of engage, more engaging to think about, um, you know, I'll lay out a, a disability myth. I will talk about an example, but we're, we should always be thinking of how we see um, those myths circulating in, in the, the texts, uh, in the communities, in the culture uh, that we identify with. Um, and that's part of the goal is, is we can't just uh, have one example, right? We want to be able to be identifying these things across cultures. Um, and I bet you all have, were already doing that when you read the chapter. I bet it's part of the process uh, in this course. And so my hope then is that uh, we can talk about some of those examples. So uh, I will pause and give an opportunity for people to volunteer some examples. And we can do that simply by, by raising your hand and I'll select you in the, I'll, I'll say your name in, in, the, in the talk. But it's also completely okay to type some examples into the chat and I can make sure to read those aloud, okay? So I'll just get going. Um, all right, so uh, to begin with, I, I, I wanna sort of um, lay out what rhetoric is and, and what rhetoricians do. Uh, I would say that rhetoricians focus on the uses of language for persuasive ends. A lot of people recognize rhetoric kind of only in a negative or pejorative sense as the intentional misuse of language to mislead and obscure meaning. Certainly we're living in an era uh, of a lot of intentional misuse of language. But rhetoricians also recognize the ways that rhetoric shapes not just utterances or inscriptions, but also beliefs, values, institutions, and even bodies. One simple way to define rhetoric is to say that it's the study of all communication. But more specifically, rhetoricians foreground the persuasive potential of all texts and artifacts, questioning the sedimentation of meanings, recognizing the constant negotiations between, for example, speakers and their audiences or authors and their audiences, and linking language to power. Rhetoric can be seen as an operational discursive means of shaping identity, community, cultural processes and institutions and everyday being in the world. Rhetoric not only impacts all of those variables in our lives that are not given and thus subject to opinion and persuasion, but rhetoric also works to whittle away our sense that any part of our lives could ever truly be set and certain. I see rhetoric as the strategic study of the circulation of power through communication. Further, I believe that we should re recognize rhetoric as the circulation of discourse through the body. When we do so, we, we expand our available means for, for persuasion. And where we do so, we find the conflict and variation that compel any rhetorical endeavor. Following this definition, my book, Disability Rhetorics, focused on the central role of the body in rhetoric as the engine for all communication. In the book, I look for those moments in history when cultural ideas about the body and its potential shift, and when rhetorical possibilities transform and expand also. The, the book really was about searching for those shifts, looking for meaningful bodies, and interrogating the entailments of those changing values. The hope was to impel further shifts in our understanding of disability and the rhetorical body. In doing so, I argued for a critical alliance between disability studies and rhetoric. Disability studies asks rhetoricians to pay close attention to embodied difference. And in return, rhetorical approaches give disability studies practitioners means of understanding the debates that in part shape those bodies. 
So rhetoric needs disability studies as a reminder to pay critical and careful attention to the body, which historically it doesn't, hasn't wanted to do, right? And disability studies also needs rhetoric to better understand and negotiate the ways that discourse represents and impacts the experience of disability and thus the experience of being in any body. In that effort to, discuss, uh, to kind of uncover this alliance, I feel we're forced to productively reconsider and redefine rhetoric, its definitions, canonizations, operations, and values. So the book tells several important stories about the rhetorical bodies, about the rhetorical body. Not all the stories, not even the most important ones, certainly not a lot of well-known ones, and definitely not stories that can be easily confined uh, to, to these kind of definitions and overviews. In fact, the stories I chose were chosen because the bodies in them have considerable momentum, power, and multiplicity that exceed the restraint of being written. So I think we need to be looking for spaces and moments in which tension around the body is most pronounced so that we can amplify and recirculate that tension. In situating disability as uniquely rhetorical, the book was meant to challenge cultural meanings that surround disability. And that needs to happen, right? And I think we can kind of get into that. Um, so uh, in that spirit, so, so I, I think that need to, um, to challenge the cultural meanings that surround disability, right? Is important because disability itself needs to be seen as positively meaningful and meaning making. And it hasn't been, right? It's in general been constructed as negative and as a, a surface upon which meanings could be projected not as a, a space from which meaning comes, right? So in the book, I show that ten I try to show how that tension around the body exists first, because efforts to define rhetoric have so often denied and denigrated and ignored the body. And second, because that denial has always been impossible, right? Third, because modern body values and anxieties have always been mapped back across history. And finally, because studying any, cultural's attitude, any culture's attitudes and arguments about the body always connect us intimately with attitudes and arguments about rhetorical possibility. So that is, to care about the body is to care about how we make meaning, to care about how we persuade and move ourselves and others. The method of writing the book in layering myths and proposing interpretations, troubling accepted stories and proposing new ones, invites further and unforeseen uses and beginnings. So much of the book is about offering teachers and students ways to apply disability studies and rhetoric to their own work and their own thinking. In that spirit, I've given everyone this, this uh, a game card or a, a um, uh, worksheet to play along with as we go. So I'm gonna explain a specific disability myth and I'm gonna give my own example, but then I want you to jot down or think through some of your own examples and then I want us to share them. So I do have a little bit more speaking to do before I get into the myths, because I want to talk about this idea of, of mythology to begin with, right? As Rosemary Garland Thompson writes, quote, seeing disability as a representational system engages several premises of current critical theory. That representation structures reality, that the margins constitute the center, that human identity is multiple and unstable, and that all analysis and evaluation has political implications. With this in mind, I'm offering this overview of some of the myths of disability that are ubiquitous across cultures and eras and that condition our understanding of disability. I call these myths, but we also might think of them as stereotypes or as tropes. They may not be fully mythological in the rich rhetorical sense of myth, but they're myths in the manner of Roland Barthes' mythologies. Meanings are attached to these images and they become routinized and easily consumed. Each one of these myths is also a misplacement of meaning. They're stereotypes because they're often narrow and inflexible and render simple understandings. They're tropes because they shape stories and they implot stories. They're rhetorical because they provide material for a wide range of expressions, whether through compressed analogies or longer narratives. Regardless, these figures shape both stories and lives. As Joseph Shapiro has shown, quote, disabled people have become sensitized to depictions of disability in popular culture, religion, and history. There they find constant description of a disabled person's proper role as either an object of pity or a source of inspiration. The images are internalized by disabled and non-disabled people alike, and they build social stereotypes, 
create artificial limitations and contribute to discrimination. So I borrow from, for, for, this, uh, for this taxonomy from several sources, including Shapiro, Addo Quayson, Rosemary Garland Thompson, Michael Norden, Paul Longmore, Leonard Craigle, Kregel, Mitchell and Schneider, right? Um, G. Thomas Kauser, they're, they're gathered from a lot of different places, right? Um, and the, the use of these myths in discourse borrows from and shapes cultural beliefs about disability in the, every, in the everyday, right? So, okay. The other thing I'll say is that these are all kind of negative depictions. And disability studies as a field often gets dismissed as a mode of what we might call, quote, negative critique. We're repeatedly stuck saying that disability is not this, not this, and not this, right? Although that litany may feel a bit rote to many disability studies scholars and students, or a bit trenchant to those who are new to the field, laying out these kind of disability wrongs generates a range of possible awarenesses, critical tools, and disruptions. The fact that disability is so naturally and habitually associated with neg negativity in our society means that we can't neglect to question those natural habits. And we can't forget that the pause, reflection, and reconsideration we might engender will themselves be critical and creative opportunities. All right, so the, the aim in naming each of these myths is to relate them more broadly to logics of normativity and ableism, moving beyond cultural representations that are right or wrong, and linking these narratives to genealogies of no knowledge. And you get to help with doing that linking. Okay, so here we go. First disability myth is disability as pathology. We know that people with disabilities have historically been labeled, sorted, classified and arrayed on scales according to their deviation from standardized norms. Science, medicine, therapeutic, and even pharmacological discourses and practices cast disability as a personal debt or deviance to be cured. As pathology, disability can also never be understood as something positive, right? And I think we can see an example of this in higher education. There are very few disability studies programs in North America, right? But on university campuses, we talk about disability all the time, right? But the approach is most often medical. Um, and that approach and, and, and taking up that language, um, organizing disability uh, according to these kind of medical rubrics, that also situates disability as, um, as, as something to be killed or cured, right? And that, that links into the next um, myth, right? the myth of kill or cure. And it's not kill or cure necessarily in a university curriculum, but it is eradication, right? It is the idea that people with disabilities um, need to be cured, right? They need to be made non-disabled or that we need research that uh, eradicates forms of disability. And if we took all of that money and uh, uh, intellectual resource and, and, and all of those things that we devoted towards the idea of making disability go away and instead invested it in um, a more equitable society for disabled people, right? We could see what transformation that would allow. So you've got disability as pathology and we can all think about that, right? The fact that if you wanna get an accommodation on a university campus, the first thing you have to do is go and get a diagnosis. Um, kill or cure as well. So just as a loaded gun in the opening scenes of a movie will eventually be fired, a disabled character in general needs to be killed or cured by the end of any movie or novel in which they appear, right? We can think of Lenny's death in, of Mice and Men as a canonical example, but you all might think, I hope, be able to think of some of your own examples. It, it gets to the point when you're looking for these um, depictions that when it doesn't happen, it's jarring, right? Uh, I'm not sure this is a, maybe a little bit of an arcane movie, but there was a movie uh, that came out in the early 2000s called The Station Agent. Um, and, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the actor right now. Um, he was later in Game of Thrones. Um, uh, Peter Dinklage was the, the, the main character in the movie and a disabled character. And there's a scene in the movie where he goes and gets drunk at a bar and he's walking along a set of train tracks and we see a train coming and then he doesn't die. And it's jarring because it's expected that the disabled characters in films 
um, you know, will suffer that kind of a fate. Okay, so I see Sarah has already put in the, in the chat the Green Mile as an example that comes to mind. Are there examples from German literature that we could think about? Anybody have some examples? It's okay to sit with this for a bit too, and you don't have to, you, we don't have to share examples. You can also just use this worksheet to think through some of these things yourself. So I'm going to keep going because we, we get a little bit more sophisticated as we go, right? Um, okay, so overcoming or compensation then is another key disability myth. In this myth, the connection between disability and compensatory ability is intentional and required. The audience doesn't have to focus on the disability or challenge the stigma that this disability entails, but instead refocuses attention towards the gift. This works as a management of the fears of the temporarily able-bodied viewer, right? We can think if and when I become disabled, I'll compensate or overcome. And it acts as actually a demand placed upon disabled bodies, right? If you have a disability, you better be really good at something else. We can think about Rain Man, um, right? There's, there's a wide variety of these kinds of depictions. Almost all of the biopics around disability um, from, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, what's the one, um, the mathematician, John Nash. Uh, the, um, it's, it's why Stephen Hawking is, is, has become such a, a huge figure um, for non-disabled people, right? It's this idea that if you have a disability, you, you would then be a genius. Beautiful mind, right? A bunch of people reminded me there. Um, Okay, and I think we can think superhero narratives, absolutely, right? All, all the superhero narratives work this way, um, or not all of them, but a lot of them do. Um, so can, can you all see what I mean when I say that that works as a kind of um, psychological, uh, that there's a psychological motivation or projection from non-disabled people, right? This idea that disability becomes you know, something that they can only get their, their, their mind around if the, the person with a disability also has some compensatory ability, right? But also then that it functions as a, as a demand placed on disabled people. I think it is something that we absolutely see in higher education. It's the reason why so few disabled students seek accommodations, right? Data shows the, that in North America, something like two thirds of students with disabilities in higher ed don't seek accommodations. I think a big piece of it is this demand, this myth that you have to just work harder. You have to compensate for the disability by working even harder. Other examples or thoughts about that myth? It's a pretty harmful myth, right? Like it, it, you, you can imagine the ways that that would structure the experience of, of living with a disability. Okay, all right, um, on to the next one. So disability as object of pity and or charity. So we can think about Tiny Tim from Dickens' A Christmas Carol as a pretty perfect example, right? The other thing, uh, I'll give a personal story about this. Um, some of us might remember that in, in, uh, in Canada, we had this telethon, right? In the States, it's the Jerry Lewis telethon, but in Canada, it was the Easter Seals telethon. And there are always two kids with disabilities who are the spokespeople of Easter Seals, Timmy and Tammy, right? So my own connection to this is that my middle name is Timothy, right? When my brother Matt was born, my parents wanted to name him Timothy right? But he was disabled, and they quickly realized it wouldn't be a good idea to name a kid with disability Tim in Canada in the 70s, right? He would have been called Timmy his whole life. Um, more recently, I think we see that this pity or charity myth has become oriented around cure. So people really only seem to want to provide charity in our late capitalist society if the return on their investment is the eradication of difference. So we see organizations like, for example, Autism Speaks raising huge, huge amounts of money, um, ostensibly to do things like raise awareness, but really to put so much of that money into 
you know, a behavior modification therapy into eradication of autism, right? And so seeing disability in this case as an object of pity or charity is also oriented around that earlier myth that it must be cured, right? That the worst thing to, would be to have a disability and that it shouldn't be part of our culture, right? Yeah, Sarah notes in the chat it would, that that overcoming or compensation narrative also makes people feel like if they can't overcome or they don't have a comp you know, compensating ability, that it's their own fault, right? And that they're a failure. Um, and that relates to this idea, and there's a future, uh, one of the other myths I'll get to later is, is really the idea that disability is individuating, right? Like it's not a community identity. It's something that an individual has and that they're responsible personally for, for dealing with, addressing, over, overcoming, compensating, right? Rather than seeing it as something that's, in, that's implicated in a social dynamic and that is at least in part, in a large part, socially constructed. Okay. So physical deformity as a sign of an internal flaw. And this is something we see throughout um, children's books, right? Um, th these next two myths. I have uh, small kids, right? So I'm constantly reminded of these, of these examples, right? So Captain Hook would be an example. You know, the hook is an external sign of a devi deviously curved personality. Too often we see physical signs of disability as indicative of mental or psychological problems. The outward stigma, the product of an almost hysterical transubstantiation from interior to exterior. And we see that in, in, in movies very much, right? Visual mediums like movies and comic books very much. When we see an eye patch or a missing limb uh, or a cane, right? Those things are, are shorthand for us for uh, internal flaws, right? And those could be flaws of character. Um, those could be, uh, you know, anger over being disabled. Right, which is another way some of the, many of these myths operate is, you know, especially in something like comic books, you're so angry at having become disabled that you act out, right? That you become evil. There's a kind of causal relationship there, right? But often that causal relationship doesn't even need to exist, right? It's just so quick. We just assume that disability is evil, right? Uh, yeah, Michael's pointing out the hook is used in Bond movies or the film Charade as a sign of a devious personality. Um, Sometimes villains are first seen as something to pity, and then they subvert expectations by being evil. Detective Pikachu, as an example, I, I've watched that movie more times than I can count. Um, maybe not always wanting to, but yeah, it's a terrific example, right? And, and what becomes interesting as well is, and, and we see this more in a medium like uh, comic books, authors are often very aware of these tropes. And interesting thing hap things happen when they begin playing with the reader or the audience's expectation around these tropes and going in different directions. And I think it's important to try to find those examples as well. It's like I said in my introduction, these, these myths never work perfectly, right? There's always a kind of breakdown in meaning because we know that real bodies, that real subjectivities don't work this way, right? That this shorthand um, doesn't work. So in fact, they kind of like break down the narrative uh, whenever, they, whenever they pop up in a narrative. Okay, so disability is evil as well, right? We see it in a lot of children's literature, which bulges with disfigured pirates and witches outfitted with the requisite crutches and eye patches. And the, the, the reality of course, is that a lot of children fear disabled people because this, these are the, the images that, that they, that they you know, consume when they're very young. I mean, I had, my oldest was a hugely into pirates and that was really difficult for me as a parent, but my spin always was, you know, can we think about um, pirating as a very dangerous uh, form of labor, right? Uh, and, you know, subject to um, injury, you know? And in that case, understand pirates as, you know, um, disabled in part due to the fact that the labor that they're involved in is so dangerous, right? Um, okay. Can other people think of some examples of, of, you know, this idea of a sign of an internal or an essential evil that's characterized by kind of outward signs? Facial deformity, absolutely, yeah. 
And it sounds, Michael is saying, you, you all looked at one of Grimm's fairy tales, right? Scar and the Lion King, yeah. It's interesting too, because we know the other thing that happens is, I'm talking about this idea that a physical deformity, um, that we read it back as a kind of internal flaw, but the, it's the other thing that's happening most of the time, right? Uh, you, you, you add the, the, the scar, right? And you call the character scar because you need it to be evil, right? It's a shortcut. It's a pretty cheap kind of shortcut, right? Um, but we see that really frequently. Okay. All right, and the other, the other flip side of this is very often um, disability as pure good or pure innocence. And we see all kinds of rhetorics of infantilization and paternalism that power those myths. The result of, of that kind of myth is that people with disabilities are disallowed from being bad or fallible or from being full people, right? And thus they can't be really, as I said, fully human. Or if they somehow fail to live up to that kind of standard of perfection, then that failure becomes really pronounced. Um, you know, we could, you could use the example of Walt Jr. from Breaking Bad. And I'm not, not sure how many people are aware of that, of that series, right? For so much of the series, the goodness and purity of Walt Jr. was so key to driving the plot, right? But if people haven't seen it, I won't spoil the whole series. Uh, but we can think of these kinds of examples. And this is something that I know personally, um, because, I, because a, a, a big part of my family's hist history was fighting for my brother's right to go to school with my sister and I to be included in a reg regular school because of his disabilities. Um, the truth was when he did get included, he was really very often kind of infantilized. And he used to, he, he, people spoke to him in a voice, the kind of voice that you used to speak to children, right? And babies, even when he was 20, 25, 30 years old. Um, that trope really does condition so much of life for a lot of disabled people, right? They, people coming and taking their wheelchair, begin pushing them in some direction that they didn't want to go, right? Um, because they're seen as kind of uh, infant, you know? Um, but then also the idea that uh, you have to be perfect right? You have to be virtuous. Um, you can't be fallible, right? Uh, so it, it, I like that, that example from Mindy, the hunchback of Notre Dame um, uh, or elephant man shouting, I'm a human being, right? Um, okay, lots of examples coming up. Okay, uh, so those, th these are a lot of these tropes are around characterization, right? And uh, the other thing is, I think once you begin looking for them, you s begin seeing them everywhere. Right. So I, I hope I haven't planted that seed too, too, uh, too, too much, but I do think you all over the next couple of weeks will begin seeing these things uh, in, in the media you consume. But also, I think disability functions not just through characterization, but often through plotment. Right. A character with a disability, when they appear within a plot, they always do particular types of things. Right. And authors can become aware of that and, and, and use that in very interesting ways, but a lot of the times it's not used in a very interesting way. The killer cure idea is, is maybe the most powerful one. Uh, and that is simply the idea that by the end of the, the novel, you know, the character will be dead, unfortunately, or will be cured, right? They'll set down their crutches and begin walking. It's a miracle. Um, but, but a big piece of this is that disabled characters are not often the protagonist, right? They're in fact a kind of um, pivot within, within, a, within a novel, for example, or movie. And how other people treat the disabled character is a test of the main characters, right? And it's this idea, and I call the myth, disability as an ethical test. How a protagonist treats disabled characters often establishes that hero's ethos or character, right? Pat Thompson recognizes this as, quote, an infuriating genre, which might be deemed a second fiddle uh, scenario. In those types of books or novels, there is indeed a disabled character, but they exist only to promote the personal develop of, development of the main able-bodied character, right? We could think of the beast in Beauty and the Beast, you know, is, is he's central to the plot of the story and that we can gauge Beauty's development of morality based upon her acceptance of the beast, 
right? But what happens at the end? The same thing with the movie Rain Man. I'm not sure how familiar you are, you are with it, but you know Tom Cruise's character is a flawed person until he goes back to visit his brother. His brother helps him to become a better person. But again, what happens at the end? He leaves his brother back at the institution, right? So the, the relationship has only been functional to the degree that it makes him a better person and then he can, he can leave, right? Um, uh, I talk a little bit more about Breaking Bad as, a, as an example as well there because Walt, you know, sets out to, to uh, I don't want to give too much away if you haven't seen it, right? But he sets out as a drug dealer because he wants to support his son, right? And he wants to pay for his own cancer treatment. Um, it goes the other way, though. He becomes a worse and worse character, right? Despite those uh, motivations from the beginning, right? He fails the ethical test. And characters do and do not fail those tests um, in, in their relationship to, to disabled characters all the time. So can people think of some more examples of those? There's a few in here, right? Um, das Bethel by von Locarno, I'm not sorry for my pronunciation, where a character with a disability drives the plot, right? Me before you, absolutely. I can't, I, I remember that, but not, it's been a while. Um, Sick Lit makes use of that, right? The Fault in Our Stars. Yeah, a lot, a lot of young adult novels do this, right? There's a character with a disease, disability, or illness, and, um, you know, the building's, you know, the character develops as a, as a, adult as a person um, through the ways that they structure kind of often pity and charity around that character, right? And that relationship helps them learn how to form relationships with other people. But that's the problem, right? They then go off and form those relationships with other people and the disabled character is kind of left. And that never, can I just say, that never works, right? It, it's a, it, it makes the plot break down when that kind of thing happens, right? It becomes impossible to watch a movie like Rain Man and leave that movie feeling as though the character has developed because the only thing that they needed to not do was leave the brother back in the institution, you know? And it's what they eventually failed to do, right? Okay, another, p another uh, myth here is disability is isolating and individuated. As Tanya Chichkovsky puts it, even though over 1 billion people worldwide have disabilities, the impulse for isolation mandates that they be seen tautologically as, quote, a huge number of the unfortunate few. This belief that disability should be isolating is reinforced by and also justifies the warehousing of people with disabilities in institutions, segregated classrooms, sheltered workshops, um, uh, you know, senior living residences in our current context and so on, right? Um, and we can think of that in a lot of these, in a lot of these texts that I've just given examples of, like in Rain Man, you know, the person with a disability is left alone at the end, right? They help other people learn how to form relationships, but then they're not part of the, the, the picture at the end. I think we see this in so much in, in contemporary society, um, because seeing disability as something that's located in one individual uh, means we don't have to recognize the forces that cause disablement. And I think about the university's approach to disability as being really exemplary of this, right? Disability is something that happens to one person, right? And when, they, when that disability pops up, we hit it with some accommodations that stay with that one person in that one class, right? and never change what we're doing. The accommodation process tells us to just make one temporary accommodation for one person, right? Instead of saying, if, if this helped that one disabled student, how should that change my teaching for, in, in a broad range of ways, right? Moving forward forever. Um, but the toll then, the, the, the burden is on the disabled student to over and over again, negotiate for a temporary accommodation, right? And there's very little that changes. Yeah, plan to return to campus also exemplifies that approach. Instead of thinking about the shared experience that so many people are gonna have in coming back to campus, we say each individual person submit a petition, right? Um, and I think we can think about, you know, maybe let me point, put this as a question. Why? Why in our culture do we have these forces that make 
individual, make disability seem individual. <laughs> Sarah says neoliberalism, sure. I mean, that is a force for that, that. That's a force that neoliberalism exerts on all of us, right? Michael says to obscure the fact that that we'll all also encounter disability in our own bodies. I think there's some of that projection, which is a fear of disability, right? Seeing as something that's located in some, one other person's body makes it seem less scary, right? I think also it allows us to not change big things, you know, it's because not, uh, uh, Kai is saying because non-disabled people see it as such as in they see disability as simply the other and not a community of people, right? I think it disallows kind of political action, right? It, 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 it makes it more difficult for disabled people to locate one another and to work together to advocate for change. It also encourages temporarily non-disabled people not to be allies, right? not to understand that they're eventually part of that community themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, another myth here, and I've only got a few more to get through here, um, uh, is disability as a sign of a social ill, right? Um, simply, uh, similarly, disability as a symptom of human abuse of nature. I think both of these are really big, right? They seem small, but they're actually huge. And there's some really interesting work done by uh, a disability theorist named Sonara Taylor, who looks at, and, and similarly, um, uh, uh, Eli Clare looks at this, the ways that contemporary environmental discourses use disability. So when we argue that we're treating our world poorly, we hold up disability as a sign of that treatment. in a way that's very problematic, right? We hold up the disablement, for example, of, um, or we, we hold up the disablement of entire communities as an example, right, of the ways that we are mistreating the environment. But that, that also kind of stereotypes and limits the roles of those communities um, and of those people. Can people recognize some examples of this kind of trope? Sure, Stephen talks about that, that, that this is a huge, I mean, the, the kind of um, uh, refrigerator babies discourse in the 80s and 90s, that there was very much this idea that specifically autistic children, um, you know, that was the fault of a poor connection between the mother and the child, right? And even though that's completely kind of discredited, it still circulates, right, as a... Uh, a kind of cultural idea. Disabled students, uh, children being seen as a punishment for the parents wrong moral or ethical behaviors. Um, it seems like maybe I haven't given the greatest example of this disability as, as a symptom of human uh, abuse of uh, the environment, right? Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, like in, in comic books, uh, Swamp Thing is the perfect example of this, right? But actually there's a ton of villains in, in um, comic books who are disabled because of um, you know, nuclear meltdowns or toxic waste uh, or, or um, you know, other, in, other ways that we've either through a military action or pollution um, or experimentation, right? Um, treated the world in the wrong way, right? Um, underestimated the, 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 the harm that we were causing to the world. And then that gets symbolized in the singular character, uh, often evil character of one person, right? Amy points out uh, Harley Quinn. And, and Michael talks about, eco, does eco-criticism play into this? Absolutely, right? We see a, a lot of the literature that gets that gets held up by eco-critics as kind of a key to, um, to that field 
where nobody's troubling the really um, harmful, dangerous disability stereotypes that circulate in that, in that literature. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, all right, so um, a couple of more, a couple more here. Um, again, kind of that, that work uh, in terms of employment, um, but also that we can see in, in kind of, in, in many ways in our, in our culture. One is disability drift, right? And in that myth, physical disabilities are equated with mental disabilities and vice versa, right? I gave the example of my brother, because he was in a wheelchair, it was assumed that he was also cognitively or psychologically disabled, right? Disability drift also works to make the disability overpower all other facets of an individual's personality. Um, so we rarely see characters with disabilities for whom the disability is not the central defining characteristic, right? Um, the other thing I'll say about disability drift, um, well, I'll get to that when I get to disability drop. <laughs> um, disability drift also um, interacts with an idea of there being a hierarchy of disabilities, right? That there are some ways that are better to be disabled than others. Uh, and I think that's a reality because we have so many negative stereotypes around disability. And I'll give you an example. You know, in, in Ontario, there was a successful Ontario Human Rights Commission appeal um, so that students would not have to disclose their disability diagnosis to get accommodations. And the reasoning for that was that some disability diagnoses, simply the words, for example, schizophrenia, for example, bipolar. Those words carry such heavy stigma, particularly in certain contexts, that they are just different from other disabilities. Um, and it's that this idea of a hierarchy of disabilities, that there are some disabilities that are okay, right? And others that aren't. Some that we can talk about and others that we shouldn't, right? This structured that way by stigma, but it, it becomes something that really causes a lot of harm. Um, and it becomes part of how we internalize ableism too, right? That there are some disabilities that people could be willing to claim and others that they wouldn't, right? Um, and it encourages people to make kind of downward comparisons within the disability community, right? Previous speaker pointed out it's especially active in non-visible disabilities, absolutely, right? Um, and I guess, you know, it's exactly the kind of thing we see on a university campus, right? The Human Rights Code doesn't distinguish between types of disabilities, but people do. Um, okay, so another myth then is disability drop. And this, yeah, yeah, Kai points out the horror movies, right? The taboo around talking about mental illness because it's inherently seen as bad, right? Um, and I think, I mean, another way to look at it is to say, like, some disabilities, it's easy enough to slap some form of compensation onto them. If you have a physical disability, you're in a wheelchair, it's fixed. There's a ramp, there's an elevator, it's all fixed, you know. Um, but some forms of, of, of mental or psychological disability, there's, in our culture, we don't see there as being a fix, right? Um, and that, become, that, that means it's a much less manageable, um, containable uh, narrative. And that makes people really uncomfortable. Again, in part probably from their own projection of fear around becoming disabled. Um, okay, uh, disability drop. If this interacts with the push to cure disability, um, with that push for overcoming, and the idea that, that Dis people with disabilities, even when their disabilities are real, are faking or embellishing those disabilities, right? And this happens in films when characters with disabilities drop the act of being disabled as part of the climax of a narrative. Ellen Samuels has looked, um, yeah, tons of spoiler alerts here and all the examples that we would give, right? Um, Ellen Samuels has looked extensively at this phenomenon, phenomenon in film, literature, and culture, labeling it the disability con, and linking it to persistent backlash against social assistance and entitlements for people with disabilities. Uh, this interacts in so many powerful ways with narratives and tropes and stereotypes around race, right? The idea that, that um, you know, of, of the wealth, the, the, the figure of the welfare mother, right? Somebody who's collecting social assistance uh, for the wrong reasons, 
right? It's something that absolutely circulates on college campuses, the idea that students fake disabilities to get accommodations, right? And the reality of it is the accommodations, the compensation that people get, if you looked at it, actually something like the Ontario Disability Support Program, those folks are actually getting exempted from discussions and experimentation around the um, um, uh, uh, standard, standardized income because they make so much less than a livable wage, right? So the idea that you would go out of your way and do all of these different things to fake a disability is in many ways absurd, simply because what you would get as a result of all of that work is so minimal, right? Um, yeah, so a big thing on the internet, as soon as you're seen as disabled, you're immediately scrutinized and it's claimed that you're faking, right? We have examples about from, from German um, movies, faking a visible disability to gain the affection of a girl. That's something that's very common. There's a whole bunch of really bad American movies that do that too, right? Um, the other thing is that it, it, it puts the lie to so many of these narratives because the disability drop is there in the actors. Very, very few disabled roles are played by disabled actors. So they're all dropping the disability as soon as the movie's over anyway. And we see some really interesting things happen in terms of media and PR. So if a character play, if, if an actor plays a disabled character, there will be a feature, right, in a glossy magazine the month after the movie comes out, showing them to be unbelievably able-bodied, right, to distance themselves from that character. Um, and we see that phenomenon, especially for, for female actors, um, but we see it all the time. And the truth is there are a lot of unbelievably talented disabled actors, but there seems to be more, or there at least there has been more of an appetite or desire to actually have non-disabled people play disabled characters. For many years, it was the best, most sure way to get an Oscar. And I'm not kidding about that. Like if you go back and look at the, the best actor, Oscar, there was a, a, a sequence of like seven years in a row where it was an able-bodied actor playing a disabled character. It was basically the only way from Tom Hanks to Russell Crowe uh, to Daniel Day-Lewis, right? Um, and it was seen as a kind of pinnacle of, of acting talent to be able to inhabit that, that um, you know, body that inhabit that subjectivity. And again, I think that's very much because we want to push disability away as much as we can, right? That it is something that we could all and, and would all be able to drop. Okay, so that's all of my myths here. Um, I want to have lots of time here for questions and also for you all to discuss, if you want to, some more of the examples that you're given, that, that you've given, right? Or try them out um, on one another. So I'm going to open things up now to, to questions and discussion. Kai, yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering also about like, in general robots in fiction, especially those that are like androids and stuff. And so they have this inherent disability of not being human. And um, I'm really mostly thinking about Data from Star Trek because that's his whole kind of character that he just wants to be more human. And yeah, when you think about it, like in this kind of pursuit, he is human. That That is a very human thing to do. But for me, somehow these like, it's very interesting because a lot of the time these robots are then given like, oh, that feels very autistic, for example. Like I know a lot of autistic people really like data because of that because they're like oh I see myself in him and so I was thinking like I guess how uh, under what disability myth would that kind of thing be like robots in general just as a metaphor for that so both in like that kind of pursuit but also robots who are um broken down missing pieces and then some, when they get those pieces they're all okay again um and it's like I'll maybe, okay, sorry, I think I answered my own question. It might be with the- I love the, it, yeah. Eth uh, the ethical test, because usually that robot is like um, a side character and the main characters are helping him get back uh, together, I guess. 
But I think there's something really actually powerful and, and much bigger, right? It doesn't, th those care, the, the treatment of those characters especially doesn't work, right? And I don't know, I don't wanna call anybody else here, but, but other people may have some ideas about this, especially as a character like Data, who has been picked up very much within, within the autistic community and talked about quite a bit. And I'm no, I'm no expert on that, but um, part of what I see happening with a character like that is Data becomes a mirror held up to the kinds of norms uh, of kind of normate society, right? And there's this idea that um, data in studying how other people interact and communicate and those interaction and communication norms can in some ways like point out some of their absurdities in a way that's really interesting and powerful, right? But suffers the consequences of not following those norms a lot of the time too. Right. And there's a lot of characters like that. And I think there were characters like that before we understood autism, for example, the ways that we do now. Um, but there's something interesting going on there. And it also never exactly works. Right. Um, uh, because there's an idea that there's something missing from data. Right. Um, Yet on the other hand, you can read through the character a kind of critique of norms and of normate culture, right? Uh, as being like a set of rules that may, it might not be very use, uh, it might not be very, um, that, that, that those rules don't make much sense and that they might not be wor really worth following anyway. You know what I mean? There's some tension there. Yeah. Other thoughts about that character or, or characters like Data? Right, Amy points out that autistic people love Vulcans too. And the great thing is that Spock, say, is a valuable member of the team because of his different mode of logic and empathy, right? Has a different way of approaching problems and crises and scenarios than others, right? And that, yeah, I think that gets held up as, as in, in, a, in a way, a critique of um, normate, you know, emotional attachments or, or whatever. Yeah, that, but there's always a kind of deficit built in there. Michael, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, I, a little bit different. I was struck by uh, by what you just said about the Oscars and uh, that imp inhabiting, uh, impersonating a, a disabled character was really seen as the ultimate acting uh, uh, proof of acting prowess. I'm also wondering about that about categories, right? If we think, for example, of acting acting as a female character, like Mrs. Doubtfire or something. There's always this ridiculous part of it, or um, I don't know, there were these god awful movies where two black characters uh, uh, inhabited white uh, characters. It is that, that is always sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But here it, it seems that, uh, that being taken seriously as an actor because they can portray persons with disability also points towards the permeability of the category itself. There's no nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It, it, you know, you can, you can do it. And it also then emphasizes uh, the whole fakeness idea of, uh, uh, of his disability. You move into it, you move, move out of it. It isn't a real identity. It is something that you yeah. assume. Uh, so it's it's there is I think there's a difference a epistemological difference in in the way these these are approached. Sorry, that was and a it, comment more than a question. No, I love it. Th that's the point here. I'm not. I, these don't need to be questions at all, right? Like we we learn so much from just kind of thinking these things through. It makes me think that the other piece is it only works and functions in, in a in a seriously fucked up society where we institutionalized disabled people, where we segregate them, right? Where we, where we warehouse them, where, where you know, let's be honest, where they, they, they don't have the kinds of choices and options that other people have, right? Then that kind of a society is much more, uh, doesn't look the other way and accepts the idea that disability has a purely fictional character, you know? It's because, we don't see disability in our communities because it's, you know, physically relocated. <laughs> you know, that, that, 
we only get these kind. You only live with these kinds of, of, of one dimensional perspectives on disability or a culture where you want non disabled actors playing disabled characters right when you have so um, historically structured the society right to 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 create a system where we don't have this, as many disabled actors we don't right we don't have those opportunities. Um, and where a lot of people don't have much interaction with disabled people, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, that, that also kind of breaks down too, because we actually really do. We, we think that we don't until we really think about it, you know? Um, anyway, yeah. Other ideas? Angelina, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a different question. Um, sure. Your article, or right now in your talk, you talked about Breaking Bad as a good example of well-rounded characters with uh, disabilities, or at least a progress, I'd say. Have you noticed um, a change of representation of differently able people in media representation since then? Or have you, have you considered conducting a diachronic analysis of maybe changes in development and uh, representation? Yeah, I think, well, there's a few things, right? Things are, are changing drastically, right? We, we even see, you know, um, the musician Sia had that film video thing that came out a couple of years ago and really got in trouble for not having an autistic character playing the autistic role, right? Um, we wouldn't have seen that even a decade ago. It was completely accepted. And it, you know, like I said, it was, it was every Oscars. Um, so there are some things around the politics of representation that have shifted re relatively rapidly. Um, you know, I, I hate the comparisons, but you know, much more slowly for disability than for, you know, mm -hmm. for, for other, for other um, you know, forms of representation, but whatever, you know, that, that's, that's not always the case, sometimes the case. Um, so I think that there's that. Um, I also think we have a much more diffuse cultural landscape, right? There is just like content everywhere. Uh, it's a little bit less monolithic. And I think there's a lot more content that is created by disabled folks. And that naturally leads to more complicated representations, more interesting representations, um, challenging a lot of these tropes and stereotypes. I think you, you look at, um, and I write about this a little bit with a, with a colleague of mine about like, you know, graphic narrative, a graphic memoirs and disability, where there's this really interesting work you can do where you take all of the traditional tropes of representing the body in, in comics and graphic narrative, right? And yet now you get to tell your own story of, of your own body, of your own disability, right? And, and it's really actually powerful and rich because we have this history that's so rife with stereotype, you know? That when you begin kind of um, from a, another perspective telling the stories, there's a lot of semiotic resources there, if that makes sense, you know? Um, so I do, I, I do think that there's, you know, but on the other hand, I don't think that there's a lot of push through these narratives to move out of an individual subjectivity and to talk about something like disability justice, right? The ways that disability intersects with other forms of oppression, um, the ways that we need to change, you know, cultural and, and social norms. Too often it's still narrated through an individual person's story right, rather than a kind of form of, of, of community culture or collective or political organization. You know, that, that kind of thing is still to, to come, um, but I'm sure that I, I feel very confident that it will. Um, the problem then is how do you get broad uptake of stories about disability that aren't just the one dimensional ones? Are, are those stories only being consumed and generated by smaller communities, right? And not necessarily a broader, you know, part of a bigger, broader cultural conversation. Michael, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, just, just to follow up on that, uh, what I found 
uh, not so much in the representation, although that uh, there's one case that comes to mind that also happened that is, is the whole economic paradigm. The disability is only seen as a cost, an economic cost. Um, yeah. So maybe I, I was wondering if, uh, if you could maybe uh, comment on this whole um, change of, 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 of the normate discourse of, uh, of really, um, I, I don't know how to, to formulate this, uh, how normal society defines itself <laughs> via the disability discourse and how, um, how we use it as a method of exclusion then. Does that make any sense? I'm well, a little, little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I think that's a big trope is like the idea that people with disabilities are faking it to get some kind of form of resources or compensation, right? That's one piece. Um, even though, as I've said, there's nothing but costs associated in our, our culture with disability, right? And and often people to, to, to get even resources to be able to live independently, they're trading off, for example, their, their right to employment, you know? So, so they're, they're giving more, away more liberty, right, than they're gaining in our culture. Um, and we are moving further away from, uh, uh, so some of those tropes around social supports have shifted because we just have less social supports. We're privatizing healthcare. We're privatizing mm -hmm. care, period. At a time when uh, demographically, um, epidemiologically, we're gonna need care so much more, right? Than we ever have before. And I really urge people to look at some of the disability um, justice work around care, um, which, which is something as a culture, we, we, we badly, badly need to reconfigure and rethink about. And you know who, who the best folks are to talk through that reconfiguring is disabled people because they have had to structure through their lives interdependence, you know, something that we're all so scared of. Um, you know, my brother, I'll give you an example. You know, he used sign language. He only had the use of one hand to complete a sign he needed another person all the time. So he needed people who, tr who he could trust to even communicate what he needed. That's really scary to a lot of people. And it's an extreme example, but we're all going to have to learn uh, how to structure more independent lives with other people and with, for ourselves. The, the pandemic, we're failing it pretty bad, right? Um, I think it's one of the most you know, one of the biggest, most important things that we all have to figure out as a culture is how to ask for help from one another and how to give help to one another as we age, right? As we deal with illness in ways that maybe we haven't had to deal with it before. As we need to do things for ourselves to protect other people, right? As we need to ask people to, to give up some of their own liberties to protect us. All of those dynamics are things that disabled communities and disabled people are expert at. Um, but at the same time, I think, Michael, we're, we're, we're not moving in that direction. We're moving in a direction where, you know, uh, we're monetizing all of these cultures around fear of disability, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many different ways that we can invest to, be, to not be disabled, right? You want a good startup idea, it will, it will be something that makes people less scared of aging, less scared of becoming disabled, less worried about losing their memory, less, you know, seriously, this is a giant industry. These are the biggest industries, right? Um, anyway, so I don't want to soapbox it, but do people, do people, um, yes, yeah, Michael points out, best investment ideas, companies that run, you know, those are, you know, and that's all Doug Ford's buddies, you know, so it, um, that's, and that shift away from, away from a kind of social contract, um, towards a, a capitalist, um, system is going to make the experience of disability different and not in a good way. Um, you know, and it's all the more reason for us to be talking about it in, in, 
at a place like a university where we do talk about disability in all these different ways, but altogether too often, it's about cure. It's about eradication. It's not about the, the ways that if we came from a disability rights or a disability justice perspective, we'd have a much better way of approaching some of the biggest problems we're gonna face over the next 20 years. Angelina? When talking about university and educational context, um, you mentioned accommodating people with disabilities in these contexts. Do you see a potential for change in accessibility mechanisms like inclusive classrooms at an increased uh, usage of easy language, for example? Um, or is this just a form of moral cleanup campaign? I love that phrase. <laughs> I see moral cleanup all over the place. Yeah, moral cleanup on aisle three. Um, I love that. I love it and I hate it, obviously. Because um, so much of it is just um, signifying, you know, uh, it's not substantive, you know, and, and I, there was some discussion in the chat and, and my more recent work does look at things like universal design, right? To sort of say, instead of this model where disability is an individual thing that gets accommodated in an individual way, how do we change, um, how do we make bigger structural changes, right? If we can agree that part, in part the experience of disability is constructed by inaccessible societies, for example, if we made everything more accessible, it would be better for everyone, right? But unfortunately, universities will talk about things like universal design and you know what they're gonna say, they're gonna make a checklist. Here's a bunch of things that Michael could do in his classroom to make it more accessible, right? Well, universal design, the actual roots of it would say, what are the largest structural forces, right? Of discrimination right, or the largest barriers. So a university then wouldn't be allowed to talk about universal design if they weren't willing to talk about getting rid of time tests and exams, right? If they weren't willing to talk about the big things that cause, you know, barriers for students. Um, instead, I think it will be operationalized as a bunch of little tips and tricks, right? Pedagogical hacks that individual instructors will take on if they're good instructors, right? Um, and they'll be rewarded for, but that won't have much of an impact, unfortunately. Michael? Sorry, I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, sit on the whole discussion, but uh, since you mentioned inventory, I wanted to bring it back a little bit to your chapter uh, because we read it in conjunction with Mitchell and Snyder. And uh, when we look at their categorization of methodologies of disability analysis, it seems that yours falls quite squarely into the negative imagery yeah. um, uh, uh, category methodology. And they're also highly critical of that as being static, um, as being ahistorical, um, as just creating an inventory that you can then, you know, okay, I see this, I see this, I see this, it's all negative. It, it isn't really productive, but it seems to me when I read your examples, that that is really not what you're stuck on. You seem to bring in uh, way many more approaches. Can you maybe uh, talk a little bit more about your methodology and analysis of these cultural artifacts? Yeah, well, I think, okay, so comes, I mean, that's pretty early in my research career to this stuff, but um, the goal, part, part of the goal was always that people push disability away. And one of the reasons they push it away is because they're constantly worried about getting it wrong. Using the wrong language, the wrong, saying the wrong thing. Um, and that really stops a conversation before it can even start. Right? It, it, on the other, so that's the basic piece, right? Is that just, in, and, and I knew that in terms of my own teaching, I wanted to be able to gather these things together and share them with students because it's what students actually really wanted to be able to feel safe to engage in the conversation at all, right? Now, if that's all you're doing, that's problematic, except that I actually think kind of like epistemologically, as soon as you start seeing these simplified um, depictions, they break down and there's so much more happening, 
you know? Mm -hmm. And Mitchell and Snyder talk about this. Uh, I don't know if it's in the chapter you read, but there's this kind of story of going to a literature um, uh, uh, um, uh, conference in Japan and, and meeting a Japanese uh, uh, critic there and saying, you know, we study, we study disability in American literature and the Japanese critic saying, oh, wow, I can't think of any disability in American literature. And then waiting like 10 seconds and being like, oh my God, it's everywhere, right? Yeah. Faulkner, Heming, like it's all of it. There's none of it that isn't, you know? Yeah. But there was something there that made the critics say first, oh, what a weird area. I can't imagine that. Yeah. And then saying, I said, but, but I study Japanese literature and there's no disability in Japanese literature. And waiting 10 seconds and being, then being like, oh crap. It's everywhere, of course it is, right? But there's this kind of, um, you know, there's something there that keeps people from seeing the obvious around disability. And so, yeah, yeah, actually, I do think you have to point it out. You do have to talk about it. And when you do, you start seeing it a lot more. And there's that block comes down, right? And when the block comes down and you start seeing it more, you start understanding, okay, hold on. Disability is actually central to how we make meaning. It's there always, you know? And that's what I'm trying to get at is, is you know, that's the takeaway. And the rest of the book, you know, that later on in the book is the inner chapter of disability rhetorics, where I'm really trying to, to go in the other direction and say, here are a bunch of examples of where disability is used to signify something that's not negative at all, right? Mm -hmm. But something that's really powerful, you know, how speaking, um, or communicating or um, signifying through a disabled body is in fact so generative, right? And that that, that, that is available, right? But, but there's so much work to do to get to that point. And one of the places we have to go through, I think, is just acknowledging that like, you know, yeah, for five or six years, every Academy Award went to a disabled actor and we didn't notice it and we didn't talk about it, you know? But like, let's talk about it. So I think that would be my answer. My answer, And you know what? I really see later on in Mitchell and Snyder's writing too, that they move much, much more in that direction as well. And that theory of narrative prosthesis that they get to, it is really this idea that wherever disability pops up in a simplified way, it's actually doing something way, way more powerful. And it, for example, it's making your narrator unreliable. To depict disability so um, narrowly, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and it does something really powerful for anybody who reads literature, just in saying there's not a set meaning that we get out of disability. Mm -hmm. That your affective engagement with a disabled character can absolutely transcend what the author was trying to do in writing that character a particular way, you know, um, and it impels all of these other meanings. Um, that, that maybe the author was not intending. You know, I think of an example like, um, like, like the movie Rain Man, you know, you, can't, you cannot identify with Tom Cruise's character, even though that is the goal of the entire movie. And something much more powerful and critical comes out of never liking him because of how he treats his brother, you know? Mm -hmm. And because, and, and all that you want is to keep, is to stay with the brother. <laughs> so you know so, even though he was set up as a, as a minor or secondary character so 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 these uh these categories um uh, then then you would see more as an entry point as a sort of a safe entry point and i mean literature in many ways is a safe space to engage with these topics uh because you're really talking about something abstract and you can you know, push your fears uh, aside on on that and take it from there. And I must admit, you know, this is the first time engaging with uh, with the topic. Uh, I have personal reasons for it as, as well. Um, uh, but yeah, I was very hesitant because of of the charge language, because of the continuously evolving language. And to be honest, I have a better vocabulary in English than I do in German for this, uh, because mm -hmm. German seems to be much more, you know. Uh, the, the, the abled in German is a double negative, not disabled. So it's, yeah, it, it is, it is pretty, it's pretty touchy. And, and, and uh, for, for me, and I would think for, for the members of the seminar, there are certain 
we call in German Berührungsängste. We, you know, a hesitancy to even touch this topic. But uh, yeah, as, as I went through, I thought it is incredibly important. It isn't, I don't think it is as ubiquitous in German, in the history of German literature as it is in the English corpus and English archive. But uh, I sat down the other day and just uh, made a short bibliography of things, uh, you know, of, of books they could analyze. And my gosh, I think I ended up with three pages, something yeah. like that. It, it yeah. is, it is prevalent, yeah. Well, it'd be awesome for you all to get to talk to Ali next week as well, or, or whenever yeah. that is. I think that's really cool. Um, I got to be part of Ali's um, committee um, back a little while ago. Um, but, but I think a good way to take what we've talked about and push it even further, um, will be, yeah. that would be really, really great. Yeah. yeah. And I hope that you all find ways to, to think this through in, in your own work and, 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 and the work that you're doing. And, and if you do, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. So, so, you know, please be in touch. Uh, I don't like, we don't have a disability studies program at Waterloo, but we always have students who are doing work in the field. And it's really rewarding to get to connect with those students and try to support that work. Because, like I said, I think it's, it's so essential, so important, so important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. so I, uh, if there are, oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to, to close up. So if there yeah. aren't any more questions, we'd like to thank you very much for this very enlightening and engaging presentation on uh, disability rhetorics. I think we all enjoyed talking about it and seeing how many examples we can come up with in our daily lives and media representation. And we appreciate you having here and clarifying this research area. And as you already said, if there are any more questions, they should contact you. Um, I think That's the email great. is also on your website. If necessary, just Google. Yeah, I threw it up in the chat there. I threw it up in the Thank chat. you very much for your talk. Yeah. Thank you all and good luck with the rest of your term. Thank you, Jay. Also for offering yourself as a resource for us. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I may come to you because I'm working on something right now. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, take care, everyone. You too, thanks. Okay, I'll see you all next week then. Are there any questions or comments? Final questions, comments? No?